Hey, it's Illuminosic. In this video, we're going to talk about La Planta Maestra Bovensana, um, one of the most important plant teachers of the Shipibo tradition. It's used by tribes all over the Amazon basin. It's found from Colombia to Bolivia and Brazil, Ecuador, Peru. Um, an amazing plant, and it's the plant that actually taught me to open my heart and gave me my first experience of unconditional love. Of course, some of the credit has to go to my partner, um, who was also an inspiration for that. So do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. Okay, first let's talk a little bit about what plant diets are, because some of you may be unfamiliar. Um, they're mostly popularized, I think, by the Shipibo tradition, and uh, the dietas are a healing process that usually involves some very strict uh, dietary restrictions and um, prohibitions against using chemical deodorants, toothpaste, having sex, masturbating, basically the same thing as the ayahuasca dieta, the standard ayahuasca dieta, except that it may be even more strict in the case of something like bobinsana because the energies, uh, the consciousness of this plant is so subtle that if you um, <clears throat> have anything that's going to impede the plant's um, transmission to your being, um, it's, it's going to negate the efficacy of the dieta in total. Sometimes before the dieta commences or at the beginning of every day, there are baths that are taken either in the plant or in um, maybe matiko or some other plant that is intended to cleanse the energy. A lot of times purgatives or um, plants that induce vomiting like tobacco will be used. A lot of times um, in, in, in the diet, dieta will start very, very early in the morning and <clears throat> teas are consumed just consisting of the plant being dieted or uh, a combination of the plant and other herbs. Um, which spirit ally uh, the curandero is prescribing, I guess, uh, depends on the emotional, spiritual, or physical ailment that is going to be addressed. Uh, the Noya Rao, for example, is um, also known as like the Tree of Light, uh, or the Path of Truth, and it is considered the most powerful of all the plant teachers and is supposed to confer enlightenment. The leaves of this tree actually glow in the dark. Um, I've been in the jungle and I, I didn't know what it was at the time, but there were uh, leaves scattered around the forest floor at night that were bioluminescing which is common in the cloud forest, everything bioluminesces, but that is a bioluminescent bacteria. And uh, I do believe that in the case of the Tree of Light, that it is actually something in the leaves that causes this bioluminescence. Chiric Sananga is another plant that is often dieted that is in the Solanaceae family. The overall objective of dieting with uh, Bobinsana and most of the other master plant teachers is surprisingly similar to the objective in the Western cult mystery traditions, and I think all forms of magic, um, and just spiritual practices in general, are ultimately aimed at the amelioration of uh, the effects of trauma and um, uh, connecting us with our higher self so that we can make our lives about creativity, about expression, and particularly in some mode that is healing or somehow progresses the uh, evolution of consciousness and the spiritual evolution of mankind. So let's talk specifically about Bobinsana, which is the subject of this video. It is related to the mimosa tree. Um, it has these pink and white starburst flowers that are just absolutely beautiful. And this is one of those instances, I've spoken about this a couple of times in my other videos, uh, where something was significant in my life since childhood. And the significance or the reason for the significance didn't become clear until, you know, decades into my life. I personally take it as evidence of this sort of like higher order of consciousness that permeates the universe. Bobinsana being as it is in the mimosa family, um, it's also related to peas. Um, the flower is identical to the uh, mimosa flower. I'm not really sure exactly what the name for this tree is. Uh, it's an invasive species from Japan that grows all over the place in Virginia where I'm from and it was both my mother's favorite flower and my favorite flower as a child and it wasn't just like it was a favorite flower I was really fascinated by it I, I love the smell and uh, I remember like pulling over on the side of the road if we saw the trees to collect the flowers and so 
for the flower to obtain this kind of significance through the Bobinsana uh, later on in life was quite extraordinary. This plant grows 46 meters tall and is usually found by waterways. Um, as I said, it has the beautiful pink and white starburst flowers, um, the very distinctive shrub. The bark is used for treating uh, rheumatoid arthritis as a contraceptive and as a general nervous system stimulant. The roots are used for uterine problems and for just general cleansing of the blood. The entire plant uh, is used as a general tonic and it is said that the bark and the flowers are the most potent. Intuitively, um, I always felt that the plant needs to be used when it's in bloom. As a medicine of spirit, the, this plant is used uh, to open the heart, to also to solidify boundaries so that uh, the influence of um, parasitic people or entities is um, sort of easier to defend against or to shut out of our being. It is said to heal traumas. Shaman use it in order to receive ikaros and also is supposed to be a very powerful agent to aid in lucid dreaming, which is of course a very powerful tool for the shaman in his work. This plant can be dieted alone or it can be consumed with ayahuasca as I consumed it. And the purpose of consuming these plants with ayahuasca is that ayahuasca opens up our energetic grid to be more receptive to the consciousness of the other plants. And uh, as we'll see later in the video, um, the ayahuasca did indeed amplify uh, the Bobinsana's effect and it was extremely powerful and it did have a noticeable presence um, both in the aesthetic of the visions of the ayahuasca that night and also the feeling and presence. This plant is suspected to contain MAOIs, uh, in particular tetrahydroharmine, and <clears throat> I plan to eventually do some experiments uh, using a plant that contains DMT in combination with just the bobinsana with no vine, and um, we'll see what kind of effect that we get from that. Okay, so my personal experience with this plant. Um, as a child, I, uh, I had a lot of emotional abuse, I think, and so I had kind of put up a firewall between myself and the rest of the world emotionally. And this very rarely ever came down. I think in the last 25 years, the only time that I've really cried was when my dog died. Um, I, I, I have a tendency to be very, very detached, and all of my engagements with people and the world in general are very much uh, cerebral in nature. Uh, and I didn't really know the extent of this until um, I encountered my partner for the first time. And so I had flown to Ecuador to uh, see my mother and to uh, drink ayahuasca. I think I'd had three or four ceremonies and it was like the next morning after a very powerful ceremony I was still very much feeling the presence of the medicine and I went into a coffee shop to uh, get I assume a um, vegetarian sandwich because I was on a strict diet and um, I saw my partner for the first time and it was very much like a cliche from a movie that every time stopped and sound, there was no sound and um, it's like everything froze for a minute and uh, almost like she's like sparkling like, um, what is that old movie, uh, Wayne's World, when he, the Dreamweaver scene, you know. Um, and I heard this distinctly female um, voice that I associated with ayahuasca or Pachamama say, she will have your babies. And it wasn't like a sexually charged um, thought, it was just like a very matter of fact, um, and, and it very much was as if it wasn't coming from me. So I, I, <clears throat> that kind of broke this trance that I was in, and because I thought that's just ridiculous, you know, she's 14 years younger and didn't, just there was no indication in her style or dress that she would have any interest in me, so I just kind of pushed this out of my head and went to sit at the bar where she was serving um, drinks and food. and. I didn't really say much to her, but over the course of the next few weeks, uh, everywhere I went, it's like she would appear beside me, and oftentimes we wouldn't even really talk much. If I tried to make conversation, she kind of seemed disinterested, and I was really confused because she would, you know, tag along with me, but didn't really seem interested in engaging with me, so it was, it was really baffling, and I did feel this um, very powerful... Um, it wasn't romantic love, but I, I definitely felt a very deep and 
a profound and very pure connection with her. I could tell that she was carrying something very heavy. And um, I had a very genuine interest in helping her to alleviate it, which really isn't that uncommon for me. But the extent of it and, and the, the, my ability to separate whatever attractions or um, romantic impulses that I might have had from this sort of totally um, selfless uh, empathy. Um, I, I very much wanted to help her to alleviate herself of her, her, her emotional burdens, which were very much apparent. And so, interestingly, a week or so later, I was on the bus with the shaman, and he, uh, I was thinking about this experience and particularly uh, when I heard the female voice say you know she will be having her babies um, I, this thought was passing through my head and the shaman who, who did this kind of thing very consistently if you watch my other videos I've mentioned it a number of times uh, he looked at me and he said when I met my partner the first thought I had was she's going to have my babies and of course they have like three children or something now and so that was a bit of a shock, and I'm not going to get too deeply into most of the story here because I'm going to make another video about uh, Twin Flames and uh, a vision that I had with Ayahuasca that showed me what that actually means and how it happens on the plane of pure consciousness or energy. Um, so keep your eyes out for that one. Okay, so <clears throat> long story relatively short. I had extended the invitation to accompany me um, to my partner uh, to some ayahuasca ceremonies because I thought that that would be um, very helpful for her and another friend. And they were both kind of hesitant at first and um, I didn't really put any pressure or encourage, I just put it out there. But I distinctly said uh, I think three ceremonies in a row would be the best. Um, scenario for us. And this shaman, uh, during my uh, stay in Ecuador, had never done that before. It was always one night or maybe two nights, but never three in a row. And so I get a message from my partner saying that uh, she would indeed um, like to accompany me and my other friend as well decided at the same time that she wanted to come as well. And uh, <clears throat> it was right before I was scheduled to leave Ecuador and there were three ceremonies in a row. And so I assured them that uh, the ceremonies were always small and they would get lots of attention from the shaman and this turned out to be the first time as well that this was not true. There were way too many people uh, after the effect, I mean, this is not, I'm not saying the guy's a bad shaman, but he definitely overextended himself. The first two nights were relatively uneventful, at least for me. It was the third night that there was a guest facilitator uh, and he had just done a diet with Bovinsana. And so I didn't even remember this until six months later that Bobinsana had been added on the third night, which um, speaking of, you know, this higher consciousness that I believe permeates the universe, this seems like one of those coincidences that is just almost like too much to believe that it's purely coincidental, that this plant of opening the heart um, happened to be the admixture plant on the third night of this uh, string of ceremonies. Okay, so the night of the ceremony um, and the effects of the Boban Sana. Right away when the medicine started to work, I noticed that there was this pink hue and a sort of uh, off orange that was dominating the experience that I had never perceived before and uh, or experienced in ceremony. And <clears throat> um, it was very, very powerful and it was a lot of chaos because there were way too many people. In fact, one of the facilitators became overwhelmed at one point and I had to kind of babysit him and put him back together. So uh, even though there were three facilitators, there were just so many people that they were totally overwhelmed. Nothing really bad happened, but it was definitely way more chaos than I was anticipating. So at one point I went off by myself, I think, to go and use the toilet. And uh, as I was returning, I was hearing this, uh, I called it Jaguar vomiting. The um, shaman who had made the ayahuasca with the Bobinsana that night was on the ground just making this like <laughs> like I you know it's impossible to recreate this without the ayahuasca but it was extraordinary I was really impressed by it but um my partner was extremely disturbed by it and <laughs> as I was approaching the teepee again I looked over first and I saw the the shaman on the ground 
um, <clears throat> going through his Jaguar vomiting process. And, you know, from a shamanic perspective, what he was doing is absorbing all the negative energy from the collective. And it was way too many people, you know, and he's taking this all into himself and attempting to transmute it, but it had paralyzed him. He was totally helpless. And so I got him some water and some tobacco to inhale into his nose to kind of focus his head and got him on his feet. And after I was done dealing with him, I went back over to the TP entrance and I see my partner on the ground sobbing because the the shaman even though he was put back together commenced his jaguar vomiting again and uh enrica did not like it so <clears throat> i wasn't really sure if it was her because her hair was changing colors <laughs> from like red to orange to yellow to black and i didn't really know her that well at this point either so i wasn't really like sure what to do and i remember kind of just standing there looking at her and <clears throat> um the female facilitator assistant a uh, very angelic, beautiful girl came up and um, looked at me like, what are you doing standing there with your mouth hanging open like while she's on the ground sobbing? And so she gets her up and takes her off and does some prob work with, probably gave her some rape or something. And um, <clears throat> so she brings her back into the tent and lays her down. And then the room just turns like blinding orange. And the three facilitators are suddenly... Um, right next to in Enrica and I on the floor we're laying and um, <clears throat> they're singing a song directly to us something about love is blooming and I realized that we're holding hands and it's still very plutonic like but it was extremely powerful I was just looking at her and listening to her you know she was kind of like snickering and mumbling and I was just so enamored but I was just also so happy I had never seen her um, smile so much and uh, look so empowered you know she'd been very quiet and reserved and uh, I, at one point earlier in the night I remember I had to convince her to breathe deeply because it's like she had the self-esteem issues that made her feel like she didn't even deserve the breath that she was breathing and so we worked through all of these things and she became very ha happy and and um, <clears throat> after the shaman sang the song about you know love blooming uh, they went back and sat down and the guy that had made the medicine comes and he starts playing this song on the harmonica that, you know, again, I couldn't begin to describe it, but it somehow embodied the, it somehow embodied the DMT ayahuasca uh, aesthetic and spirit so incredibly that I almost couldn't even believe it was happening. Truly extraordinary. At some point in the night, also, I remember <clears throat> I, I, I had gone out of the teepee without my partner and when I came back, and laid down between my partner and the friend that I had brought, I experienced their presence as like this ball of blue energetic light that was like pure feminine essence sort of concentrated. And <clears throat> I have not had the best relationship with uh, the feminine, particularly in the earlier years of my life. Um, and there was something about this uh, immersion in this pure feminine being that was tremendously healing for me. Another notable incident that night, uh, as I was walking back to the teepee at one point, I was passing a plant and I sort of felt it summon my attention and I looked over and it turned into uh, an elephant very much reminiscent of Ganesh. And one of the practices of the shaman is to consume ayahuasca and say if someone has been bitten by a snake, they will go out into the jungle and look for the plant that transforms into the head of a snake and they know that this is the plant that they need to treat the snake bite victim. And so uh, the, uh, another incident that I experienced along these lines, um, I had a very bad parasite infestation and um, during the process of having the visions that night with the ayahuasca, I um, looked down and I could see into my stomach and there were bugs crawling everywhere. And Pachamama told me, you know, you remember when you were lost in the woods in California uh, and you drank from the stream, you uh, acquired all these parasites. And she <laughs> sending me to the toilet very regularly. She said, I'm trying to flush them out, but I cannot kill the eggs. If you go into the forest, I'll show you which plant to use to consume to kill the parasites. Of course, I uh, I didn't I, I didn't take her advice because I was thinking, you know, it's it's 
in the middle of the night, Amazon rainforest. I'm not going to just go eat a plant. I, I kind of wish in retrospect that I had gone out and collected the plant and looked it up to make sure it was safe and then made a tea or something to um, experiment with this. Uh, <clears throat> but at any rate, the next day, I asked the shaman what this plant was for and he said, well, it is, it is consumed to remove obstacles. The connection with Ganesh being obvious. I, I could not get Enrique to remain quiet. And there are certain periods in the Shuar way where, you know, they, there's supposed to be absolute silence in the um, teepee. And so um, I had to get her up and get her out, which was not easy. And uh, I took her to the bathroom and I remember standing there with her, waiting for her to return. And I knew that I had this feeling like my heart was just totally open. And I knew that I had served my purpose in her life, that the medicine had served uh, its purpose as I intended it. And I fully expected that my work with her was done. I would never see her again. And it, I wasn't even sad. I just had this tremendous feeling of love and um, I was just sort of resigned to my fate that, you know, I knew that I was deeply in love with this person, but that, you know, I didn't know if it was appropriate to pursue it and I didn't care at all. And I realized uh, at that moment, standing there by the bushes, that I had experienced unconditional love for the first time. And eventually she returned. And uh, at that moment, um, the shaman came walking up <clears throat> and he thanked me because he knew that even though I had paid to be there that night, I had been assisting with people, even the facilitators, I'm helping put them back together. And you know, he said, I wanna thank you for, you know, being there and helping and uh he told us a story which i'll relate in closing uh he said the first time that i shit my pants on the medicine i saw a blazing eagle of fire flying through the air and it came and landed in my hand and and i asked the medicine show me my future and the crystal ball became heavier and heavier and heavier and as my hand sunk when it passed my waist <laughs> I shit my pants <laughs> and that was hilarious so we all returned to the teepee and um, as I said earlier it wasn't until a year or two later that I remembered this experience I was reading about Bob and Sana and how it opens the heart and teaches unconditional love and um, <clears throat> I remembered this facilitator saying that he had just dieted with Bobinsana and that he had put it in the medicine. So the relationship remained plutonic. Um, the night that I was supposed to fly back to the United States, we had decided to drink San Pedro together and uh, just a relatively light dose. Um, and I didn't tell her that my stepfather was coming to pick me up at five o'clock in the morning to take me to the airport to go um, back to the States for my mother's funeral. Uh, and so I remember at one point we were talking to each other from the perspective of the general masculine and the general feminine. Eventually I'll make a video kind of talking about this. It's something I've experienced a few times and it's pretty interesting. But um, <clears throat> eventually, I don't really remember how this came up, but we realized that, you know, this was a romantic scenario, but I kind of refused to actually do anything about it because I felt like we were in an altered state I was about to leave, you know, I explained to her, well, there's something I haven't told you. Um, I'm leaving in a couple hours. And so it was heart wrenching. Uh, my, my stepfather finally came. Um, I wanted to jump out of the car like 60 times on the way to the airport. But after a few months, uh, Enrica came to see me in California and the adventure that ensued was absolutely ridiculous. We <clears throat> ran afoul of a notorious outlaw pot growing family, uh, no fault of ours in Northern California. So we went on tour with the dead and fish for a while. And uh, during a break in the tour in LA, we actually were basically taken in off the streets by Bob Dylan's ex-wife of 20 years. Uh, if you're familiar with his music, you might know the song um, Stuck Inside of Memphis with the mobile blues again. Uh, Ruthie uh, from the Honky Tonk Saloon, that line, um, this woman was that Ruthie. And uh, for me, in the culture that I come from, it's kind of like being taken in by a character from a Shakespeare play or something in the, the modern era's equivalent of that. Um, 
<clears throat> and so, like I said, I'm going to make another video t kind of talking about this story in more detail. But um, eventually, we returned to Ecuador so I could continue uh, my apprenticeship with the medicine. And I had referenced that, you know, Ayahuasca had told me that she would have my babies. And I was never a family-oriented kind of person. I, I, it's not like this was something that I was looking for. It was quite a surprise when we discovered that she was indeed pregnant. Uh, this was under some pretty amazing circumstances as well. I, I, I made a video talking about this already. I'll put a link to that, um, to that video. Uh, but our son is now six months old. And the relationship has been tremendously healing for both of us. There's virtually no toxicity. It's been very healthy. It's as if we really truly were hatched from the same cosmic egg which is precisely what ayahuasca showed me in this vision that night when we drank the bobinsana and the ayahuasca. But if you want to hear more about that, you're going to have to watch the next video. I'll make a part two where I will go into detail about this vision. Because aside from the explanation of what the twin flame theory is really about, I was also that night given a vision by ayahuasca of sort of how creation happened and how uh, once the one divided into two and that became three, there was just this process that was reflected in every other process, and uh, it's quite an amazing story. So it's been an incredible voyage, and we are deeply in love. Not only did the medicine bring us together, but it prepared us to receive each other in a way that was healthy and to confront um, the psychological and emotional aberrations that may have complicated the relationship. And... Um, the entire process has been extraordinary and even miraculous. So keep your eyes out for my next video, which is going to be uh, a conspiracy video, but it is not really going to be about conspiracies. We're going to talk a lot about cognitive dissonance, cognitive bias, selective perception, uh, even pathological denial, because I feel like I'm seeing um, what I would describe as sort of psychological disarray that is totally pervasive in pretty much every different sector of the demographic spectrum in the United States and not so bad in most of the rest of the world, particularly in the United States, but that's where I'm from. And I think that to this day, the United States is still kind of a beacon. Um, <clears throat> so what happens politically there and the direction that they take and the moves that they make are going to influence the rest of the world to some extent. Um, so it's going to be an important video, so I hope you guys all watch that, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Hit the like button, share, share subscribe, and please do support us on Patreon during these trying times.